Welcome to Reedy Creek Baptist Church's online church service. My name is Robbie and I'm really glad that you've been able to join with us at this time. I hope your week's going well. Here in Australia at the moment, half of the population is in lockdown and you know what, it can get pretty disheartening wherever you are when you're in lockdown, but if you just continue to hand that over to the Lord and just say, you know what, this is God's battle and rest in His strength, you will endure. He has given you what you need to endure this lockdown and to not only just endure it, but to thrive when you come out of it. So it's my prayer and our prayer here from Queensland where we do have relative freedom that you guys will experience the freedom in Christ despite the fact you can't leave your houses. In just a little while, the Reverend Dr. Tony Woods will be continuing our series, our Keeping It Real series, on the topic of prayer. And we're going to sing some songs and we'll have a little bit of an update about our Let's Refurbish Reedy program that's happening as well. Look, genuinely hope that you will be enriched and encouraged by the time that you spend with us here today.
got a couple of church announcements for you. First up, today is the last day of the Let's Refurbish Reedy program. We've done a fantastic effort so far. We've raised $36,500 with a little bit more money still to come. I wonder if you've managed to contribute to that uh, yet. You've got two more days to do so. The bank details are up next to me here. If you have a look outside, you will see that the work on the playground has already begun. Yes, we've got the softball going down and the new turf and it, it's going to look fantastic. We've had the house down at the bottom of the block here at the church has been bulldozed over and demolished and that's gone. And Below the stage is where our studio, studio is, where we record our online services. And also we've renovated down there because the op shop has its storage area down there. And today we've opened that space up for you to go down after church and have a look at some of the projects that have been going on. And you'll be able to see the studio and go in through the rooms. It's, uh, it's quite special when you're seeing what's happening. There is lots of things happening around the church at the moment. This is the last week also that you can uh, register to attend our Supernatural Faith Spring Conference. It's next weekend on Saturday night and Sunday morning. Um, you've got to go to our website and events and register on there. It's 15 bucks, you're going to get dinner. It's going to be a great time of worship and diving, a deep dive into the Word of God and about what it is to live supernaturally as believers in Christ. This week also on Wednesday, it's the Let's Get Together Open Day and the organisers have put a lot of work into this. There's going to be billiards tables and table tennis and all sorts of uh, activities and shoebox packing as well for Operation Christmas Child. So it'd be really great to see uh, a whole bunch of visitors and people just coming to check it out. So if you're available, Wednesday morning, 9 till 12, come down. Um, have a feed on some homemade donuts too, by the way. Go Barb Kovac with the donuts. That's all for now. Kids, you guys can head out to your programs.
Well, good morning, everyone. Today we want to talk about prayer, making it real. But first of all, let's talk about wisdom people. You know, whenever we think of wisdom people in the Bible, I think one name usually stands out, and that would be Solomon. It's been said that there was never another man like him, neither before nor after he served as king of Israel. That was from 970 to 931 B.C. Solomon is known for his extensive building programs all around Jerusalem. But perhaps even more than his building programs, Solomon is best known for his remarkable wisdom. 1 Kings 10 tells us of the visit from the Queen of Sheba, who came for the express purpose of testing Solomon's reputation for wisdom. And in verse 7, she declares that your wisdom, wisdom and prosperity surpasses the report I heard. The chronicler of 1 Kings add his amen there, writing in chapter 4, verse 31, that Solomon was wiser than all other men. How did Solomon get so wise? What school did he go to? How did his parents raise him? What did they feed him? Well, these are answers that we might like to see the answers to ourselves, these questions. Uh, particularly, if not for our own sakes, then for the sake of our children. And actually, the secret to Solomon's wisdom is really no secret at all. We're clearly told in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, that God spoke to Solomon in a dream and said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And then in verse 9, we see Solomon's response. He said, Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish right and wrong. I think we can see from those words that Solomon's request for wisdom was already beginning to operate. I mean, just think of it. The God of the universe has just offered him his heart's desire. If you had been in his place, uh, what would you have asked for? I'd like to think that most of you here today have been around the block a couple of times, and you know already that asking for wealth is never a good idea. So I won't even preach about that. According to the figures I found in American studies, people who win multi-million dollar, dollar lotteries statistically are likely to declare bankruptcy within three to five years. People who find themselves in the top 1% of the wealthy, no matter how they got there, very rarely stay there for long. Jack Whitaker is a man who lives in West Virginia, and he wasn't afraid to come out and say it. He wrote this. He said, winning $315 million in the lottery was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. He's been robbed repeatedly, victim to everything from cyber theft to the point of a gun. His daughter and his granddaughter died of drug overdoses. And Mr. Whitaker summed up his life in one sentence. He said, I don't like what I've become. Well, I said I wasn't going to preach about that, but I did anyway. Sorry. But back to Solomon. I think we can see in his request here a key to success, both his and ours. Solomon knew that a person's heart was the gateway to God. It's your heart, at the end of the day, that separates you from the rest of creation. Out of all the awesome things God made, only people, through the free will of the heart, possess the ability to commune with Him. The Apostle Paul spelled it out in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, where he said that belief that comes from the heart results in confession with the mouth and moves us from eternal damnation to eternal salvation. Now, why is this so? Because the heart is the level at which man and God come together. On a superficial level, Listen, Satan eats our lunch. With a little smoke and a few mirrors, all of us are so easily deceived. This is that great wall that many people smack on their way to real happiness. 
They say, well, unless I can see it, touch it, hear it, then it doesn't exist. And Satan would give you a round of applause at that. That's right, he says. You are truly wise to reject those thoughts that are fighting for your acceptance. Come over here. Let me show you reality at its finest. I was just talking to a man the other day. He's lost his home, his family. He's come pretty close to losing his life over his addictions. He's in AA now, and I invited him to our church's Alpha program. I reminded him that the second of AA's 12-step path to recovery, after recognizing that you have a need, is to recognize that power greater than ourselves that can restore us to sanity. Now, this church, and especially now through the Alpha program, can help you get in touch with that power. Well, this man was polite, but he said, Look, I go to another church out of respect, but when the reality all around me moves into spiritual, I can't accept that. He was saying to me what I just said to you, Unless I can see it, touch it, hear it, then it doesn't exist. He's facing that difficulty that many of us, many of our loved ones struggle with. That challenge that Solomon himself met and got past. To realize that our heart is the gateway to God. To know that reality is so much more than we can see or touch, or hear. You know, so often we have this image of heaven as some kind of fuzzy, dreamlike existence where everything floats by, accompanied by some kind of disembodied musical soundtrack. Do, 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 Tony, is that you? Yes. Come closer. I think all of us are going to be blown away when we see what God's reality really looks like. Can you imagine, for example, vision that's not hindered by cataracts and retinas that on the best of days only take in about 0.0035% of the visible light spectrum. Now, if you have trouble with fractions like I do, Think of it this way. Light comes in wavelengths like a rainbow. And the bit that we can see is called the visible spectrum. Human eyes only take in much less than 1%. So that means that 99% of everything that goes on around us is invisible. And that's not even taking into account the spiritual dimension. Imagine now having eyes in heaven that can see it all. Senses that go beyond the five we live in. The senses of sight and sound and smell and taste and touch. You think you have a handle on reality? <laughs> think again. God spoke to Solomon in a dream. Perhaps it was a dream that was more real than he had ever experienced while he was awake. And he said to Solomon, Whatever you want, I will give. Now, let me knock your socks off. Solomon was not the only person in history to receive that kind of offer. Look with me, if you will, at John chapter 14. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and they're dealing with a huge dose of reality. In the last chapter, he told his disciples that he was about to be leaving them. Furthermore, that they would not be able to follow. Chapter 13, verse 33, where I am going, you cannot come. Peter jumps up and says, Woof. Oh yeah, listen, I will follow you even to death. Jesus was gentle, but firm. Verse 38, Peter, before the rooster crows tonight, you will deny me. Not once, not twice, 
but three times. But then Jesus moves on right into what has become easily my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. John chapter 14. And he starts out with, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in me. Believe in God. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That promise to those disciples has become a precious promise to you and to me. Anyone who is a child of God through faith in His Son, Jesus, can rest assured in that divine contract. And listen to this, John 14, 13, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And in case you missed it, Jesus repeats it in the next verse. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, if that's true, then why aren't there more Christian lottery winners? I think you know the answer to that. Because you know already what King Solomon knew, what the Apostle Paul knew, what those disciples knew, that the gateway to God lies down deep in the heart where things like wealth and physical pleasure fade into insignificance. And that brings me to what I got up here today to talk about. In keeping with our theme, keeping it real. Today's topic is real prayer. And believe it or not, that's what I've been leading up to, from Solomon to Paul to Jesus. So come with me now to Matthew chapter 6. Here's a passage that will be very familiar to you. It started back in chapter 5, and it's going to continue through chapter 7. It's known today as... The Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is interesting, I think. If you took all of the collected sayings of Jesus and put them all together, you'd come up with, oh, about an hour's worth of speaking time. The Sermon on the Mount encompasses at least 20 minutes of that time. So do the math. From Jesus' point of view, these three chapters are pretty important to His plan. And a significant portion of the Sermon on the Mount is given to His teaching on prayer. Chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. And when you pray, He says, You shall not be like the hypocrites, For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by man. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Jesus reminds us here that there is a way of praying that is meant for show. It's superficial, it's people-directed, and more often than not, God is not a part of the conversation. Now, I can think of exceptions. Here at at church, our weekday Bible studies, we pray out loud, giving everyone in the room an opportunity to take that prayer on board, to agree with it, and to add an amen to what's been lifted to the throne of God. I recall the words that Jesus prayed before the tomb of Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 41. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Here is a case of speaking to God and letting the people around you listen in. We do that often, as we should. But prayer at its heart needs to come from the heart if it's going to be real. And so, very briefly, I want to give you three practical suggestions that will help you achieve that. And these suggestions come straight from Jesus, from the Sermon on the Mount. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So here's the first suggestion for keeping your prayers real. Simply this, shut the door. Now we all know, of course, that there is an image that we project in public. And then <laughs> there's reality. I caught myself one time when I was young and even more foolish than I am now. I was at uni on my way home from a class that was determined to destroy me. How could things that seemed so simple on the first day of class now might as well be a collection of Czechoslovakian haiku? I didn't have a clue. Thinking back, I, I realized I must have been walking like a condemned man on his way to the gallows. I know that because of the change that came over me in the next few seconds. I saw a group of girls coming toward me. They were the vision of loveliness. They were the pinnacle of femininity. And we were on a collision course. I stood up straight, sucked in my gut, I adjusted my disheveled shirt. I ran a hand through my hair. I put my biggest smile on and said casually, Good morning, ladies. I don't know what those girls saw. They didn't acknowledge me at all. But I knew then, as I know now, there were two very distinct images battling for expression that morning. The expression of confident, quiet strength and the expression of the real me. Now, God knows the real you. No amount of sucking it in or slicking it down can fool Him for an instant. Trying to come before God in prayer behind a false image will serve no good purpose. And that's why Jesus said, go into your room, shut the door, and be real before God. I had a pastor one time who confessed to a constant struggle to be real. Instead of standing behind this cardboard image that everyone knew and loved about him, he said the best way he could overcome that struggle was through a daily routine as he stepped out of the shower. In front of the closet was a full-length mirror, and as the pastor would head in to get dressed, he would look at himself and say, Good morning, Reverend. First way to real prayer, shut the door. And once you're there, the second suggestion, keep it simple. Verse 7, But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. You know, I think we all have a prayer voice, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. On one hand, it's, it's simply an expression of respect. I'm, ad I'm addressing the God of the universe, after all. And for some, that means you know, full sentences. No dropping the G when you use those verbs. Say it dropping, not dropping. For some, it's necessary to switch over to King James English. It sounds a little more respectful when I address thee as thou art wont to be addressed, and not as yon pagan. Well, that's not wrong in itself. But the language that expresses the level of respect and worship you want to express to God, use that. But don't fool yourself into thinking you can get farther in your prayers by dressing them up. At best, they'll be wasted words. In the extreme, they can deceive you into thinking you're being real, when in fact, it's a sham. Sometimes our repetitions become meaningless. When we lived in Liberia, West Africa, Marcia had a medical emergency. It was only by the grace of God that she was in a mission clinic at the time, surrounded by a team of dedicated missionary doctors and nurses. As she was being prepped for surgery, they gathered around her to pray. Now, they hadn't had much sleep for a long time, and all those folks were exhausted. 
But they knew the importance of prayer, especially at a time like this. The doctor began, Father, we thank you for the assurance of your presence here with us. We pray for strength, for wisdom, and for what we are about to receive make us truly grateful. The doctor opened his eyes and he noticed everyone else was looking at him strangely. That didn't come out right, did it? <laughs> in that instance, the real prayer of those doctors and nurses were not in, was not in the eloquence of its delivery, but in the reality of their need. And God saw that, and He blessed them. Now finally, and this should be obvious, remember who you're talking to. Verse 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. How often are you tempted to remind God of a particular situation or of His promises to take care of you? I think we know that in actual fact, those reminders are for our own benefit. And that's not a bad thing to look back and recall God's faithfulness time after time. It helps us remember who God is and what He's done and why we have every reason to believe that He will never change. Lord, You, you promised to stay with me every step of the way. I'm depending on You to remember me. Of course, God does not need reminding. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So why do we ask? Forgive us our trespasses, heal our hurts, bless our loved ones. God knows what you're actually saying. Lord, I blew it big time this morning. I said things in anger that I didn't mean. Please forgive me. Heal our hurts and... By that, I mean the doctor's diagnosis I got yesterday. I'm scared. Heal me, please. Bless our loved ones. And Father, you know what I'm talking about, Lord. My son has run off the rails, and there's no way this is going to end well unless you intervene. Rest assured, God knows the heart behind those words. He doesn't need to be reminded but you need to say the words. How often in my career as a minister has, has a man come to me and said, Look, my wife knows the, that I love her. I don't need to keep saying it. Yes, you do. If you want your wife, your husband, your children, your parents to know the joy of a loving relationship, then it needs to be spoken. In the same way, God wants you to say to Him what's on your heart. Be specific, and when necessary, be brutal. Remember who you're talking to. He is the God who created you, who knows you better than you will ever know yourself, who has wonderful plans for you if you'll just be real with Him. How do you do that? Shut the door. Get alone with Him every day. Keep it simple. Don't try to impress God. Say what needs to be said in a way that you know what you're saying. Remember who you're talking to. You can't hide anything from Him. You can't impress Him with flowery language. Real prayer begins when all the facades are torn away. When you humble yourself before Him, and when you spend more time listening to Him than you do talking to Him. Well, let's talk to Him right now, shall we? We don't need to talk out loud. Real prayer begins in the heart, after all. I'm going to spend a moment in silence. This is your chance to be real. It's your chance to listen. And after a moment, I'll voice a prayer. If you're having a good time with God, just ignore me. Continue as long as you want, even after this service is finished. And if the words that I say resonate with something in your heart, then listen and make the prayer yours. Let's be silent for a minute. 
And then I'll share some scripture with you from Matthew 6. Let's pray. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. May this be all of the prayers in all of our hearts today. We'll give you the glory, for it is yours. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we lift this prayer to you, thanking you. Amen. Yeah. 